Howdy, it's Tubal Kane, your YouTube shop teacher, and this morning with a video regarding this Dayton 2 by 48 inch belt sander. I've had this for many years, I also have a couple Kalamazoo's, and uh, I went to use it the other day, and it, uh, it worked for a moment, and then uh, when I tried to start it moments later, it would not run, and there is the model of it. I've had it for many years, it also has a Dayton 1 half horse capacitor start motor on it. I bet I've had this for 25 years and it came from an auction. I seldom use it because I have those great Kalamazoo's, two of them. But this is a rather cheaply built. You can see that the wheels are stamped steel, both top and bottom. But it uh, is kind of neat in that it, it can be put in the horizontal position as well like that, but then again, so can the Kalamazoo's. So, uh, the problem was that I went to use it the other day, as I told you, and it, it worked fine. A minute later, when I went to use it again, it was pretty much locked up. You see, I just, I, I can barely get it to rotate. So, what has happened to it that suddenly? Is it a bearing failure? I don't really know, but uh, let's talk about a few things. You have heard me harangue over and over about using open frame motors around uh, abrasives. And I, I talked about that in regards to the Lyle drill grinder, not the one I had. I think it had a replacement motor on it, maybe because of this failure, but I'm deducing some of that. But we got grinding going on here, and these motors, of course, are cooled by a little fan that, that draws air through the motor. And it's open on both ends, so there's no telling how much d uh, dust there is in there. But did that cause the bearings to fail? Now, on these beautiful 2 by 48 inch Kalamazoo band sanders, bell sanders. They use a Belder motor. I love that switch that's right on there, but these are a sealed motor. They're externally cooled. You know that under the cover here there is a fan and the fan just blows air across the top of the motor so that really none of the, the debris gets into the windings or the bearings or anything like that. So this is just a, an excellent design, but there just is no doubt about it that this type of motor probably costs twice uh, as much to build as the other one. This, saw, this sander also will lay down flat, I just mentioned that. I have one of these in the garage and one in the basement. I'm in the garage right now. Enough on this. To change or remove the belt on this type of belt sander, it's just spring loaded, so one just pushes down. And the belt comes off that quickly. The belt's rather worn anyway, and now there may just be something in the motor windings or some other debris. Maybe a mouse nest is in there. I don't know, but I'll start by taking this wheel off. That's I think a six-inch wheel. This is one uh, design that I'd like to modify or copy to actually make one. A shop made. Uh, Sander, there seems to be a, an interest in that, as I talked about one of my other little Peterson products belt sanders with a 1x42. So let me get that off and start to disassemble this. Did I tell you that in a recent video, someone proudly proclaimed that they're going to give me a thumbs down because when reaming I used <laughs> the adjustable wrench in the wrong manner. So. You know, who cares? I own a hundred of them. I know there's a correct way. And, uh, you know, well, this is a correction wrench, but remember, it, it's not a correction wrench if it says so, unless it says so, on the handle. I don't know who put this bodacious <laughs> hex bolt on there instead of a set screw. I mean, it's big enough to where it probably causes a, a little vibration out of balance. Before I take a motor off or, or take something apart, quite often I take a scriber and I scribe around it so that I can put it back exactly the way I took it off and because there'll be an alignment uh, deal here. If you put the motor on crooked, the belt isn't going to track. Well, I probably will have to deal with it anyway, but that's just my MO is to often mark things. And I will take the motor off here. I probably could disassemble it without taking it off of the machine, but I, I think I'll take it off. 
Just before I started this video, my wife's gone, so I went down to McDonald's and had one of their breakfast sandwiches, which are darn good, by the way. They really got that right. And the McDonald's coffee, you know, it darn near can't be beat. You know, I don't care for the major brand out of Seattle. Um, it's so bitter. And, you know, but this is just right. Well, who cares? So, anyway, I'm taking the, the motor off. They're just uh, four bolts here on the bottom, so... Simple enough. A couple other minor issues here. The, the nut on this uh, Romex connector is dropped loose and they're probably due to vibration. Also note that the rubber isolators here are totally flattened out. They, they originally looked like suction cups, but the rubber is cracked, deteriorated, broken. The other ones over here that allow me to put it in the horizontal position are in semi-good condition. I may switch them if I'm able to get off get them off but probably should put some other feet on there and uh, I always polish up the motor shafts but I like to do that when the motor is running but one more bolt here and I like to organize things uh, you all know this so I, if I have to order bearings you know I may be working on a project like this for two weeks so I, I like to organize things so that I can find them and not get them mixed up and and I'm kind of a neat person, anal uh, along that line anyway. I think a lot of you are too. That'll give me a chance to clean up this whole machine with a wire brush and blow it off real well. I've told you many times that I worked in an electric motor shop just as a cleanup man uh, when I was in junior college. And I watched Red Hetrick at the single phase bench uh, uh, take motors apart so many times. And, you know, the, he always marked them. So that this end bell goes on this end and, and so on. I don't think you can get them mixed up anyway, but I got magic marker lines there, sharpie lines there, and then a double center punch mark here. And a single center punch mark there. And the, the punch marks will never go away, even if the sharpie marks disappear. So now I'm ready to take the draw bolts out of there. All right, three down, one to go. And take a look. Maybe it doesn't show up, but look at the dust and debris that is on that screw that went through the motor frame. So now, will these come right off? And does. Now, I'm going to polish the shaft just a little more. Now, I did run some emery cloth over it, but just a little bit of a burr there so that this end bell comes off but already look at the dust in there what were they thinking I cleaned the shaft up but it took a, a file uh, emery cloth was not enough now there's external get oilers on here so I don't believe these are ball bearings so let's pull this end bell off All right. Yeah, look at that. And this is oily here, which means that, you know, the oil came down from that bearing. Okay. <clears throat> and then look at this. What do you think of that? Oh, man. I think what I'm going to start doing off camera I'm going over uh, right outside here of the garage. I'm going to blow this out as well as I can, but, you know, this, this is outrageous. This, this is absolutely outrageous. But whatever is locking the motor up is on the other end because this end bell came off freely, and, and the bearing even seemed fine in spite of the debris here. So I'll be back in a few minutes after I blow this out nicely. I've blown it out. It's rather superficial. It's going to take a lot more cleaning than that. Let me knock the other end bell off and see what it is that just that that rotor just locked up tighter than a drum. Now as I pull this end bell off I expect it to be attached by wires because of the centrifugal switch if this is made the way most of them are and you know what that bearing isn't locked on the shaft so bearing is okay I think there's just a lot of debris in there and yes oh cheaper creepers 
All right, that's the centrifugal switch. As you know, these little split phase, uh, single phase motors have uh, uh, starting windings, and that's what the capacitor is all about, and, and running windings, and this just, you all know this? You, you know, I, I guess I don't need to cover that, but this, this is the centrifugal switch. What a mess! And now, and this is the uh, centrifugal a mechanism as the motor speeds up that comes out and kicks the starting winding out of the circuit All right. so let's pull that aside a little bit and you know that 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 rotor is just locked up so it's not the bearing so now I'm ever so gently and I'll knock it out from the other end because it might be no it'll come out this way I guess Let's see what's in there. Squirrel cage, I think they call this. I don't see any particular spot where it is rubbing, that is mechanically rubbing. But I tell you, that's dirty in there. Now, I don't think there's anyone in the Western Hemisphere that can disagree with me on the type of motor that ought to be uh, uh, installed on certain machines. You know, just, just look at this. This is almost embarrassing. You know, if anybody from Dayton is watching this, they made the motor, but they also apparently made the whole uh, machine, the device, but I mean, come on guys, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Somebody, some bean counter said, no, I use the cheapest motor, nobody knows the difference. So I'll blow this out again and uh, be right back. Now I've blown this out and still about half of it is, is in there, so I'll have to use a, a brush, uh, like a paintbrush, to get this a lot cleaner and blow it out. But the rotor here does not even fit into the stator. Uh, well, why? Well, you've heard people say, don't over oil a motor. Well, I believe somebody over oiled it over the, uh, the years through those Gitz oilers. And there's a lot of oil here. I feel it's greasy, but yet it has attracted dirt. And so in other words, this is now oversized, and this is oversized. So I'm going to clean that with solvent and see if the rotor will fit into the, the stator here. So before I bother with any of the other cleanup, and I, I'm pleased to think that I do not have to replace any bearings. Originally I thought maybe there were ball bearings in here, but those little oilers should have tipped me off. All right, that black there just came off of the, the rotor, and... I did run the other one into the stator here, and a lot came out already. I'm not done because now that it's clean enough, I can see that there is debris caked on there. And I will scrape that off or very carefully use a, a, a light wire brush. And uh, let me digress and tell you a story now. When I worked at this motor shop, they did repairs on motors anywhere between this size and 100 horsepower that they use at the cement mills. I, I've said that before, and, and I, would, I would talk to these motor, re they'd put new windings in, whatever had to be done. But the owner, or I should say the founder of this company, I never met a man, I'm 75 years old, that was as smart as this man, his name was Ross Waite. And he had to be a genius, like Einstein, but he would take the time when I'm leaning on a broom, to explain things to me. Things I couldn't understand, but he held many patents, and he was a consultant in all of the factories for, you know, 100 miles around. Anyway, he was a great influence on my life. So let me go ahead and scrape this, because you're going to see that there's debris there. But now already, I, I can put the armature in there. Now you notice sometimes I call it the armature and sometimes I call it the, the, the rotor, but did you know that, you, you knew this, stator always means that it's standing still, it's stationary. Armature windings can be on the rotor or they can be on the stator. Probably not in most motors that you see, but all right, that's 
more than I know almost. Let me clean this up and I'll be back. It's a half hour later and this debris that you see right here is what came off of the laminations in the uh, in the stator. It's a very greasy uh, dust and what has happened there essentially is it it became a, a brake drum. Uh, that was the shoes pressing down on the rotor so that's apparently all that was wrong uh, because of an open frame motor and because it was a little bit over oil so I I think it's pretty good now I I really wore out my wife's toothbrush it's just frazzled and uh, black so I'm gonna be spending a good part of the afternoon trying to get that clean and back into the bathroom so it's ready for her this evening in her boudoir well, I tightened this nut here on the Romex connector, and, and very briefly here, I don't know if I should mention this or not, but again, this is the part of the centrifugal switch, and these weights here, as the motor speeds up, comes up to operating speed, you see what happens here, and then it, it opens that uh, centrifugal switch, which I showed you in a previous clip. So I'm going to go ahead and assemble this. Now, as I put the rotor in place, oh, let me show you one other thing. Make sure you do not lose any of these little spacer washers that are probably on each end. Those are what is uh, used in the factory to adjust the end plate. If you have uh, t too few or too many, it's going to lock the rotor up as you tighten the end bells. If you have too few, you got too much end play, and that's how you can adjust end play for wear too, by the way. Add more washers. They come in many different thicknesses. But if you have... Um, too much end play, it might vary the the effects of the uh, centrifugal switch. So it's you know semi important. But when I put the rotor in place now, right there, you know it, it just turns freely. Of course, it's it's not centered without the bearings. But I mean, it's just look look at all the slop. Before it was just tighter than a bull's hind end in blowfly season. And now the other end bell. I don't want too much oil on there. So those are still good bearings. They haven't been damaged at all. I'm lining up the marks. Never force anything. And now I'll put the four bolts in. It's extremely important that you tighten the four bolts evenly so there isn't a cock or a bind in any way or the shaft the rotor may not turn it just it might be locked up. So I like to snug them up all four of them like I'm doing now and can you see that and it's turning freely. Now I'll go back and and tighten them a little more. They were very tight originally so I will use a wrench on one end and get them torqued in rather nicely but not enough to damage anything. I put the cover plate on, I put a singular drop of uh, electric motor oil in each Gitz oiler and one thing I don't like about this, well there's a lot of things I don't like but the thing that I'm talking about now, there's no switch on here. Again the bean counter said no no we're not putting a switch on that costs an extra dollar twenty five. So I got to plug it in. Let's see if it runs. <clears throat> Starts instantly. Now if you hear a little vibration that's because it's on a metal table. So it's running just as smooth as can be. So there was nothing wrong with that motor other than it needed a good cleaning. So now I'll go ahead and remount it on the machine itself. And I'm going to take a little while to clean that machine off a wire brush or just a little bit with a hand brush and uh, blow it off and then I'm ready to reassemble. I'm ready for a reassembly and again t thinking about this as a project this is a, a three inch wheel that could be a cast wheel. These are stamped sheet metal. 
This is a six inch wheel that could be cast, maybe all with the same pattern, 3D pattern that I could scale up and down at will. I've talked a lot about that. And what I've done here now, let me lay that aside. And I removed these feet, these rubber feet, look at how mutilated they are. And you know, the ones, that, and I switched them, the ones that were in the other position. So I got new feet on there. They seem to have some resilience, but you know, rubber doesn't last long. You know, a rubber band has a lifetime of 15 minutes. So let me go ahead and set the motor on here and try to line it up with my scribe marks and, and maybe it'll be pretty simple to, to line up. Otherwise, let me lay it on there. And, and, uh, in the, if you've watched the videos with the Peterson products, <laughs> band sander, uh, our whole principle there, the third wheel was on the motor, so we could uh, get the tracking of the belt onto the wheels by moving the motor in different axes. So that's how we did it. So what I'm saying here, if I mount the motor slightly crooked, I'll exaggerate it here, uh, it's not going to track. So it, it has to be lined up. That's why I made those scribe marks. I need to find a slightly smaller bolt for that lower uh, wheel and I've already cleaned this shaft so that should go on easily enough. Did I did I show you this? Oh, this just sets in here. Uh, there's a spring in here. Rather stiff spring. So that's the whole principle of this thing though. The whole frame is pretty it's pretty cheap. The motor would be the most expensive part, and they use the cheapest motor known to mankind. As I make the final assembly, you know, it just dawns on me how uh, far in does the, the wheel go on the shaft? Well, I took the liberty of taking a picture of it, so I can reassemble it the same, but of course I, I put a set screw in there and a brand new key. So that looks like about the original position, so I'll just snug it at this time and then adjust it in or out. Again, that affects the tracking on something like this. Is this wheel in line laterally with this wheel? And since this is all stampings and re relatively cheaply made, you know, it would be only semi-accurate. Let me put the belt on. All right, the motor is all tightened down, and what I did have to do was turn the machine on, and even though I had scribe marks there, with the bolts just snug, rotate it a little bit so it tracked evenly on both the top and the bottom, and I had to play a little bit with the, the position of the lower wheel. Now, if I, I tried reversing the a whole assembly up here, 180 degrees, and oh, that threw it way off, so that's not the least bit accurate. What I don't like, but I think it's always been this way since I owned it, is that the platen here, you can see, is not a parallel with the edge of the belt. But this is, this is just a cheap machine, and it re will require some more fine-tuning, I believe, but it's basically done. It always was a noisy machine, as it is now, resonating a little bit because of the metal base. Although I like, I like the rubber feet now that are reversed. Remember, it is my mission statement to edutain. that was out of the frame, but I always did like to use all of these bell sanders in the unsupported spot here for, for deburring. Works great. I was doing this, but I don't think that showed up on the frame. So, hope you like the little uh, semi-restoration. I really need a switch on here badly. I, this is just a pain in the neck, and I think unsafe. Make sure you wear a safety shield when you use any type of abrasive machine. So. This is Tool Cane saying hope you liked the video and I will see you in my next one I hope. So long for now.